Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Greg Natterer, and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science here at Memorial University. Welcome to this engineering lecture this evening. We acknowledge that the lands on which Memorial University's campuses are located are in the traditional territories of diverse Indigenous groups. And we acknowledge with respect the histories and cultures of the Beothic, Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit of this province. We encourage everyone to reflect on these lands from where you are located and the Indigenous peoples for whom these lands are traditional territory. <clears throat> Tonight, we are pleased to bring you this virtual Speaking of Engineering lecture as part of the Research Week at Memorial 2021. To find more Research Week highlights and events, go to mun.ca and search Research Week 2021. And a warm welcome to our guest speaker this evening, Dr. Sarah Power. Dr. Power is an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering in the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science, and also jointly appointed to the Division of Community Health and Humanities in the Faculty of Medicine at Memorial. I would also like to acknowledge this evening, Mark Fewer, who is the COO and Deputy Registrar of the Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Newfoundland and Labrador, or PEGANEL for short. PEGANEL is an invaluable asset to our engineering program and our graduates, and we are honored to partner with PEGANEL to provide you this lecture series. I'll invite Mark to share a few words later on this evening. This lecture series raises the awareness of engineering issues among students, the community and the general public at large. We're very proud of the work of our faculty, students and staff. And I just like to spend just a few moments sharing some of this recent success with you. Atlantic Business Magazine recently named Mun an engineering alumnus Katie Stone from the class of 2021 as one of Atlantic Canada's top 30 under 30 innovators. Her company, Aeolus, is developing lower cost ventilators for developing countries. Congratulations to Katie for this, this honor. And also recently Stanford University, one of the world's best universities, uh, published their Elsevier 2021 list of top 2% of scientists and engineers in the world and included six of our faculty members from Mun Engineering on that list. That's amazing. No wonder our students are so successful, partly since our faculty are among the best in the world. Now back to tonight's lecture. Um, tonight's talk by Dr. Power is about how brain machine interfaces can improve the lives of persons with disabilities. Brain machine interfaces or BMI for short are technologies that provide a direct communication pathway between the brain and an external device and could greatly improve the quality of life of individuals with disabilities. They've shown promise in many applications. These could range from, contro from controlling computers and wheelchairs using thought alone to helping to recover lost hand function following a stroke as just another example. Beyond this, researchers are looking into potential uses for BMIs into a variety of non-medical applications from human performance augmentation to neuromarketing. Dr. Power will explain what brain interfaces are, how they work, current state of the art, and potential applications for persons with disabilities, as well as the general population. She'll also talk about some of the important ethical issues involved in some of these technologies. Just a couple of further logistical details before we begin. Following Dr. Power's presentation, we are going to have time for questions, but please use the Q&A feature. Um, you should see that in the bottom right of your screen. And, and you can type your questions there at any time. We'll go through them at the end. Also, we are going to be recording this session and it will be posted to our website for folks who could not attend tonight's live event. 
I will now introduce Dr. Power. As I previously mentioned, she's an assistant professor in engineering and cross appointed to medicine at Memorial University. After receiving her Bachelor of Engineering degree in electrical engineering from Memorial in 2006, she pursued graduate studies in biomedical engineering at the University of Toronto, earning her Master of Applied Science and later Doctor of Philosophy degrees in 2008 and 2012, respectively. Her primary research interests lie in non-invasive brain machine interfaces. Dr. Power, over to you. That concludes my remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nadver, for the introduction. Before I start, I'm just gonna share what just happened to me. If you saw me get up from my chair, my Amazon Echo just started playing Christmas music for, for no reason in my home, and it never listens to my voice commands. <laughs> so I was frantically trying to get it to stop, and so I managed to do that. If, if Christmas music starts playing randomly again, just excuse me, I'll have to mute and go deal with that. But um, I usually get a little uh, nervous about these types of things, but after the like, heart rate spike I just had when that happened, I'm feeling much more calm now. So. Um, thank you everyone for, for coming to uh, my talk today. So, um, as Dr. Natterer said, I do research in, uh, in non-invasive non brain machine interfaces, and we'll learn a little bit more about what that means in, in this presentation. So, I'm actually not going to talk a lot about my own research because that's very specific and maybe would be uh, mostly of interest to to people who, who are within the field and, and know generally about brain machine interfaces. So I'm going to give a, a higher level overview of the field. Um, yeah, and, and uh, maybe to talk a little tiny bit about my research at the end if there's time. So we should start off by start off by just asking what is a brain machine interface? And actually, before we continue again, I'm going to do a little uh, sorry, a little terminology shift. So, brain machine interface or BMI is absolutely a valid term term to use, but um, a more common term, especially in the in the you know academic research in this field, is brain computer interface. And I realized just uh, a few minutes before my presentation that all throughout this presentation, I have brain computer interface. <laughs> so um, it means the same thing, but I just know that I'm so used to saying brain computer interface that I wouldn't be able to, to shift. So from now on, I'll say brain computer interface, but it just, it means the same thing. So what is a brain computer interface or BCI? So let's imagine that um, you have this, this cute little robot here and you want it to, to start dancing, but you want to make it start dancing just using your brain. You don't want to have to issue a voice command or or turn it on or use a remote control. You just want to use your, your brain. Well, that's what a brain computer interface would allow you to do. Um, so a brain computer interface has, um, you know, a number of main components. Um, oh, sorry, let's define it. So a brain computer interface is a, a device that translates brain activity into commands for an external device. And there's uh, a number of main components to a brain computer interface. The first being brain signal acquisition. So we need to um, collect some information about what's going on in your brain. And there are a number of different technologies that we can use to do this. Um, there's uh, we'll we'll touch on some of them throughout the presentation. But the main two kind of categories for these type for these. Uh, brain signal acquisition technologies are invasive and non-invasive. And even for BCIs generally, that's one of, there's a number of different ways that we can categorize BCIs and invasive and non-invasive is one kind of major categorization. So once we have the signals, we need to decode those signals into a command for, for the device. And of course here, this one little box doesn't really um, do this justice. This is obviously very, very complicated. It involves a lot of signal processing, machine learning. Um, and I'm actually not going to go into the technical side of this a whole lot today, but there's um, there's a lot involved in, in signal processing. These signals are very noisy. Um, we have to remove a lot of artifacts. And then, of course, there's a lot of um, machine learning involved in decoding the different states that we need to, to uh, use as commands to send to our external device. But then there's also what's going on up here in your in your brain. So notice that I say that a brain computer interface translates brain activity. 
It does not translate thoughts. So um, in the, you know, maybe the media, sometimes you might hear about brain machine interfaces or brain computer interfaces as mind reading technologies and um, you can read your thoughts. That's not quite true. Um, you can't just think about anything or any command and the brain, the brain computer interface would send that command. There's actually very specific mental activities or mental states that the BCI can decode. And depending on the BCI and its purpose and what type of signal uh, acquisition technology you're using, these there's a number of different um, kind of mental activities and states that uh, different BCIs use. And so we'll go through some examples in the rest of the of the presentation, but just keep that in mind that um, Anytime you read an article or something that says, that talks about a mind reading technology, kind of maybe take that with a grain of salt. So, I'm just going to go through uh, kind of the history of brain computer interfaces and that'll allow me to kind of talk about some of the main things. So, it all started um, a long time ago, maybe longer ago than you than you'd think um, in 1929 when Hans Berger invented EEG. So, EEG is electroencephalography. Um, you, and you may be aware that um, in the body, information is, is sent in the body from the brain to you know, the limbs, to the heart, um, and, and back again to the brain as electrical and chemical signals. So the brain is sending and receiving all of these signals all the time, and that uh, results in a lot of electrical activity in the brain. And what Hans Berger did was was discovered that we can actually sense and record that electrical activity using electrodes placed on the surface of the of the scalp. So back in 1929, of course, the technology wasn't what it is today, and he, his uh, you know his device was very large. Um, and this is actually uh, a picture of of the first EEG recording. Um, but now, of course, you know, many, many years later, we have the technology has advanced quite a bit. It's just, you know, very small electrodes. We can have up to, you know, the, you can just have one or two electrodes if that's all you need for your particular purpose, or you can have very high density electrode systems up to, you know, 256 um, electrodes. And of course, we can get signals from all of those electrodes and get a much better idea of what's going on throughout the brain. So. EEG really, you know, allowed a lot of neuroscientific research that allowed um, us to learn about uh, different cognitive processes and the neural correlates of those processes, like what different parts of the brain are responsible for, um, and also learn about different neural pathologies. And it wasn't long after EEG was invented that, that the idea of using EEG as, as kind of a communication pathway, you know, kind of started coming up. So, in 1968, actually, um, it was the first time that it was shown that features of, e of the EEG signal can be consciously controlled by the person. And in this case, it was actually the alpha wave, which is, um, uh, which is part of the EEG signal in the, in the spectrum of about 8 to 13 hertz. Um, so, Joe Camilla, uh demonstrated that people could actually intentionally control that aspect of their EEG with some training. Um, this was actually also around the time that uh, digital EEG systems, so before you may have seen in, you know, in television shows and movies when people do lie detectors, there's a little piece of paper and the, you know, the, the signal is drawn out on the paper. So that's what EEG was like, you know, up until about the late 60s, early 70s when it became digital. Um, and we could, you know, collect that data on a computer. Then in 1973, Jacques Vidal published a seminal paper where he coined the term brain computer interface. And he um, spoke about BCIs in, in these types of terms. So utilizing the brain signals in a man computer dialogue and as a means of control over external processes such as computers or prosthetic devices. So at this point, it was, more, it was mostly theoretical. Um, but a lot of the ideas that that he brought up in this paper are ideas that we still use today. So these definitions of, of brain computer interface are, are you know close to what we what we use today. So then it was about 15 years or so before again, it was all kind of theoretical, but towards the end of the 1980s, actually, we started 
very rapidly seeing um, more research in this area. Um, and the first study where they actually implemented a, you know, implemented this idea of a brain computer interface was by Farwell and Donchin um, in 1988, and they proposed a P300 speller. So remember back here when I said it's not just thoughts, the BCI cannot just decode your thoughts. It's very specific mental activities and states. This is one of the, this is one of, uh, this is an example of that. And this is actually a paradigm that's used up until today. Um, so keep in mind that at this time when the, there was kind of this started this explosion of research in brain computer interfaces, the, uh, the motivation and the target population of users for brain computer interfaces were those with severe motor disabilities. And actually, though it, it was those with the most severe uh, motor disabilities to the point of, of actually having no, um, no motor ability or motor control left. So in particular, it was individuals with late stage ALS. So when the degree, the disease progresses, you know, path, towards the, the late stages, um, there's absolutely no movement ability whatsoever. When there is movement left, even if it's just, you know, the ability to move the eyes or um, the head or, or if there's any movement left, it's probably better to go with a mechanical switch of some kind, whether it, you know, if you had, or a, think of, say, Stephen Hawking, for example, despite having had ALS for decades, he still retained enough movement that he actually, um, you know, his, his uh, speech synthesis device is very familiar to us. He programmed that using an infrared sensor that was placed on his glasses. So he actually retained enough small amount of movement that he could program it that way. Um, but the motivation for brain computer interfaces was for people who, who weren't able to use any other device and we had to, you know, not have a movement based access pathway as, as uh, it's termed, but a, but one that's based on internal signals, so the brain. So going back to Farwell and Donchin, um, oh, and by the way, that, that is still motive while the field has grown and expanded and there's different applications being explored today, um, uh, as a communication and control pathway for individuals with severe motor disabilities is still very much one of the main um, motivations for, for research even today. So going back to Varwell and Donchin um, and their P300 speller. So the P300 is an evoked potential. So it's an ev or an event related potential, ERP. So it's a potential that occurred or an electrical signal that occurs automatically in the brain. So you don't have any control over this following an, what's called an oddball stimulus. And it looks like this. It's called the P300 because it occurs approximately 300 milliseconds after the, this oddball stimulus. And an oddball stimulus is just something that you're kind of not expecting to happen. So for example, say you were hearing, say you were seeing um, a circle on the screen flashing red over and over and over again, and then all of a sudden it turned yellow. That's an odd ball. Okay, sorry. Um, that would that yellow flash would be an oddball. So in your uh, brain, about in in the central region, you'd get this P three hundred spike. So uh, this research group uh, thought to capitalize on that P three hundred and use it as a way to control an external device. So they invented a P three hundred speller. It's still kind of that terminology is still used today. So what this involves is there's on the computer screen there's a grid of letters and the columns and rows are flashing randomly. So the user focuses on whatever letter they want to type. And as that letter kind of randomly flashes, as the rows and columns are flashing, the P300 occurs. So this is a very small signal, it's quite noisy, so it's difficult to pick it out in a single trial. So it needs to have, you need to have several responses, but once you have several of those responses, so once the letter that you want to choose flashes a number of times, you can average that signal and it can be detected. And through this uh, process, a user can actually type out words. So I have a short video here just to demonstrate it. So what you'll see is exactly what I just described. So this person is wearing an EEG headset 
Um, and you can see, so here's all the letters and numbers are that they, that, you know, they can choose from the rows and columns will flash. They're going to focus on the 1 that they want to select and you'll see that. Um, work. So let's see if this will play. For some reason, my video is not playing. It worked in the practice session. Oh, here we go. It's just going to take forever to play and I'm sorry, apparently in WebEx, there's no, it uh, doesn't. Uh, work very well with the, with videos, the audio won't play. So, um, it shouldn't be, you should get the idea without the audio, but. Hmm. Okay, there we go. So let's go. In a little bit. Okay, so as you can see. The letters or the rows and columns are flashing. They're focusing on the letter they want to select. And after several flashes of that letter, it, it, the, the BCI is able to decode which um, letter the person was focusing on. And so the, the user can type in this way. So um, again, that technology or that, that kind of paradigm, control paradigm for BCIs is still used to this day. Um, obviously, you know, machine learning algorithms have, have advanced signal processing has advanced all of, all of, you know, these types of things. So that video that I just showed you was a more current version of the, the P300 speller, but still the same idea that was proposed by Farwell and Donchin. Um, we're still using that today. And then even, you know, a decade later, um, people started to explore other P300 responses. So there's actually an auditory P300 response as well. So you can imagine if you're hearing you know, a tone of the same frequency, and then all of a sudden you hear a different tone, an auditory P300 would occur. And then also a tactile P300. So um, people have expanded on this work in, by looking at these different types of responses rather than just a visual P300 response. So then just a couple of years later, in 1991, um, Wolpa et al. proposed an SMR-based BCI. So an SMR is a sensory motor rhythm which is an oscillatory activity over the sensory motor cortex. So this little picture of the brain here, where's my cursor gone? There it is. So this is the, the blue is the motor cortex, the kind of burgundy is the sensory uh, cortex. So um, this, the motor cortex is responsible for sending signals for intentional movement. Um, so, uh, yeah, so oscillatory activity, so, uh, signals at, at certain frequencies over the sensory motor cortex. Um, Wolpa et al. proposed that or, or discovered that these can be consciously controlled by the user. So this is not an ERP like the P300. This is something that the person actually has to intentionally, intentionally consciously control. Um, and in Wolpa's paradigm, they were trained by operant conditioning with neurofeedback. So that just means that the signals were detected and then some visual representation of them were shown to the user and the user just kind of had to figure out how to control it. So you could, you know, uh, and this would be used to control a BCI by say, you know, if, if you wanted to make one of two selections, um, you could raise your sensory motor rhythm amplitude and for one selection and lower your sen sensory motor rhythm amplitude to make the other selection. But again, this was done by operant conditioning. So it, it, it took a lot of training to get the person to get um, people to be able to figure out how to control this. So a couple of years after, you can see that that a lot happened in a short period here. Um, Bert Scheller et al proposed a motor imagery BCI. So this paradigm is also based on the sensory motor rhythms, but th in their paradigm, they generated these sensory motor rhythms by performing motor imagery tasks. So, um, so wh when you say execute a movement, so say if I move my hand like this, that signal is coming from my motor cortex in the area responsible for hand movement. But 
what we discovered is that what they discovered is that um, even if you just imagine moving your hand, the same area uh, is activated in your brain as if you actually execute the movement. So, again, considering that these technologies were meant for individuals with motor disabilities who could not move their hand, they, if they imagined moving their hand, then they could generate these sensory motor rhythms. And as the, in kind of the same idea as in the wool paw paradigm, if you could you know, control that by, by raising it or lowering it, or for example, generating it in different areas of the cortex. So for example, if you um, imagine moving your left hand versus imagine moving your right hand, then different areas of your brain would become active. And the BCI could sense that and use that as different commands. So different motor tasks are associated with different BCI commands. And this motor imagery BCI to this day is probably the most, well, P300 and, and motor imagery, and then one other that we're going to talk about in a minute are probably the three most uh, common uh, non-invasive BCI paradigms uh, with EEG. So I have another video here. So um, right now, the kind of the most... Here, most motor imagery BCIs are based on four, three to four commands. So it's usually imagination of the left hand, imagination of the right hand, imagination of both feet, and then sometimes also imagination of, of tongue movement. So this BCI, this is actually, a, uh, it's, it's not a super recent video. It's probably from about maybe five or six years ago, but it's actually uh, Gert Furtscheller's group um, from Austria. And <laughs> you'll see in this video, the, the uh, person here is playing World of Warcraft using just their brain. And so the commands that the BCI has been trained to recognize are left hand movement for mo moving the avatar left, right hand movement for moving the avatar right, and then moving the avatar forward is movement of both feet. So let's see if this will play more quickly than the last one. So Looks like it'll be okay. So you can see here where these arrows are showing what the BCI is detecting from the brain activity. So he's actually playing games. But by the nature of these things, there's it's kind of not much to see. It's just a guy sitting there. Um, but you'll have to take my word for it that he's he's actually controlling that avatar with his brain. Okay, so moving on, just a couple of years again later, um, Macmillan and Calhoun demonstrated the SSVEP-based BCI. So here's a, a fourth kind of control paradigm. An SSVEP is a steady state visually evoked potential. So you can probably tell by the name that it's another ERP or event related potential. And it's evoked automatically due to an external st stimulus similar to the P300. But the SSVEP um, is, so when you focus your eyes on a flashing light, if the light is between the range of approximately 3.5 to 75 Hertz, the EEG in your visual cortex, or which is in your occipital lobe in the back of your head here, um, the EEG will oscillate at that same frequency as the light you're looking at. So uh, Macmillan and Calhoun showed that it, that you can exploit this um, for BCI and, and uh, use it use different flashing lights basically to initiate commands. So the user. If they're, if they're given several different options and there's a flashing light associated with those options, then they can select one of those options by focusing on the light associated with that command. And the BCI can detect um, the frequency of the signal and associate it with the appropriate command. So again, this, tech, this uh, paradigm is also used up till today. Um, so here's a video. So back in the 1995 study, uh, Macmillan and Calhoun demonstrated actually that a, a person could use the SSB, SSVEP to control a, a plane in a, in a flight simulator. Um, but there was actually, it was just two, um, it was a binary kind of option. So move the plane left, move the plane right. So there was, you know, a, a flashing light on either side and depending on which they looked at, they could move the plane. Um, so in the time since then, um, Again, along with, you know, the detection technology, improving and all that type of thing, the 
people have also just come up with more efficient ways of using this. So in this video, you'll see that. Um, so, and this is a, this is a fairly typical um, kind of way to do this is it's it's meant for typing, so it's called an SSVEP speller. So all of the letters are in are divided amongst these top three boxes here, and then there's some other commands: finish, delete. I believe that one's I can't really see it, but I think it's either go back or previous command or something like that. And all of these boxes are going to be flashing at different frequencies, and the user will look at the one that they want to select. So whichever box that the letter that they want to select is in, they'll look at that one. The BCI will detect that, and then all of the letters in that box will then divide again amongst the top three boxes. They'll look at it again, and then it'll select it, and then all the letters in the box will again be spread amongst the top three boxes until the, there's only one letter left, and the, the BCI can figure out which letter the actual the person was actually um, trying to select. So just to see that happening, in case my explanation wasn't clear. So you can see all the boxes are flashing. She was selecting T from this box originally, and then the T went up here. And then she selected the top box, and then T goes over here. And then finally, they're able to deduce, to deduce that she wanted to select T. Okay, and then finally, in 1999, um, Burba, Niels Burbomer and his group proposed an SCP-based BCI. So, um, SPC is slow cortical potential. Um, so, a slow cortical potential is just a very low frequency wave in the brain, and Burbomer discovered that people can be trained to control that as well. So, similar to the SMR, um, you could use this as a, as a BCI control. Um, signal by you know raising the amplitude of the scp to you know to make one choice lowering it to make another choice um but uh this this signal is not used very much anymore but it, it did again demonstrate uh, this group actually demonstrated this technology being used with um individuals with with paralysis so it was still an important study in in kind of showing that bcis can be used by um people with disabilities. So that same year, um, Nicolaelis et al. showed that monkeys can control a robotic arm with an invasive BCI. So everything that we've discussed so far has been non-invasive BCI using EEG. And you can kind of tell that communication, you know, it, it's kind of one command at a time, um, maybe, you know, as in the case of the motor imagery BCI, you can get maybe you know three and four different commands. Um, but with invasive BCIs, we'll see in a second. Um, actually, is that happening now? Yes. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> in 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 invasive technology, you can get a much better signal. So let's look at why that is. So here's your brain, or here's your head, someone's head. And let's just take this little um, cut out here of your of your brain and your skull. So here, this is your skull. This kind of bony stuff, and then you have protecting your brain between your skull and your actual cortical tissue, the like your neuron neuronal tissue, is the is the meninges. So there's three main layers to the to the meninges. There's the dura matter, which is this outside one. Then there's the arachnoid layer, which is this one. Then this is the subarachnoid space, the stuff that kind of looks kind of meshy. That's like cerebrospinal fluid and, and all that type of stuff to protect your brain. And then there's the pia matter, which is right over the right over the cortex. So with EEG, which is non-invasive technology, the electrodes are sitting on the surface of your skull. And keep in mind, so all of the, you know, the electrical activity is in the neuronal tissue because the neurons are what are the, you know, all of that, um, those signals are being sent and received by the neurons. And that's where the, the electrical activity is coming from. And what we're detecting at the surface, at the EEG signals, is actually the electric fields generated by these populations of neurons that are, that are firing. So if that signal has to go from, the, and remember, these are very, very, very small signals, like microvolt level signals. So if they have to go through all of these layers and get to the EEG, you can see how that might be 
you know, the signal might not be great <laughs> by the time it gets to the EEG. And especially spatial resolution um, is poor with EEG. So this is your primary motor cortex again. Um, along here, and this is how the primary motor cortex is laid out in terms of, it, you know, all the different body parts. So, um, so for example, uh, hand is here, and leg is in here. So for that motor imagery BCI, and then tongue is here. So for that motor imagery BCI, if it was trying, if the BCI is trying to uh, decode or differentiate between activity related to finger movement and foot movement, they're pretty close together when you think about it, right? The ones here, ones here. And if you're talking about elect that you're only able to measure the electric fields generated by say a patch of neurons here versus a patch of neurons here, you could see how having to detect that signal at the surface might might make it difficult to, to distinguish those signals because those electric fields might start to kind of overlap. So the spatial resolution of the EEG is relatively poor. So if we talk about invasive technologies, so electrocorticography, for example, is where we um, we put the electrodes actually inside the skull, so they can be epidural. So remember, this is the dural, the dura. So they can be above, um, outside the dura matter, or inside. Um, and you can see how if you you know if you put the the electrodes closer to the cortex that the signal would be. And going even further, we could have, ele we have a, a intracortical micro, or sorry, intracortical electrode microarrays. And you can see here that these are, um, you know, this is very small. It's usually, you know, 100 by 100, or sorry, 10 by 10 um, electrodes. And they actually go straight into the cortical tissue so you can get a very very good signal that way and you can actually measure at the neuro the level of an individual neuron so in 1999 you know over 20 years ago um, this research group showed that monkeys can control a robotic arm with invasive bci a couple of years later five years later um, the first human invasive bci clinical trials um, were conducted so here's a video of that so you'll see that um, even though this was what 15 years ago plus, the control is much better even than the the kind of more current invasive non-invasive BCI that we saw of the World of Warcraft. So first you'll see this um, this patient controlling a robotic arm, opening and closing the robotic arm, and then you'll see that he's controlling a cursor on the screen, and he has much much better control than than um, with the invasive non-invasive BCI. So let's go to start right here. Oh, shoot. Sorry about that. I clicked forward rather than clicking. So you can see just with thinking about closing his own hand, that signal is then going to the to the arm and he's, you know, Again, what he's doing is thinking about closing and opening his arm. The this is an, an intracortical, uh, uh, sorry, an intracortical uh, sensor, so it's going right into his cortex over the motor area. Okay, so the last fifteen years, there's too much that has happened in the last fifteen years to go through it, you know, as bit by bit or or in or. Uh, study by study. So just talking generally about the last 15 years and the types of things that have, have been going on. So of course there's been advanced, as I've kind of already alluded to, there's been advancements in recording technology. So in terms of uh, non-invasive technologies, of course, you know, research grade uh, EEG has, has advanced. But one important thing is that um, in order for all of these types of technologies to be actually useful is you need to have a system that a person can use at home and it's not going to cost them, you know, $50,000 to get an EEG system. Um, so there's been a lot of work, um, you know, a, a lot of uh, even some companies are starting to pop up uh, trying to to develop um, accurate 
uh, wireless EEG systems, um, dry EEG systems. So right now with the research grade systems, you, in order to get a good contact between the electrode and the scalp, you need to put electrolyte gel in there. Um, obviously not something that would be really great to use on the on a daily basis if this was something that were, you were using, you know, as a, a communication um, assistive device. Um, and, and yeah, there's a lot of co companies popping up that are are trying to develop these systems. So there's still, you know, some of them are probably better than others, um, but but hopefully soon the technologies will be um, will be such that you know people will be able to use this at home. There's also, of course, been advancements in decoding technology as machine learning algorithms, signal processing al algorithms are improving. And so, just to show um, on the invasive side how things have improved in the last 15 years. So we looked at, we saw that video a second ago about the man who, who was opening and closing the hand with his thoughts. Um, this is a group from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Now this video is actually from, from probably seven or eight years ago. Um, but this woman, you can see, you know, she has a, an electrode array implanted in her brain in the cortical tissue. Um, and you can see the, it's coming out here, it's a wired system to the BCI and you can see that, so I, I highly recommend that this is on YouTube. I highly recommend you go and watch the full video because it tells a lot about the personal stories of the of the um, individuals as well, which is really uh, kind of adds, adds something really. Um, but she's controlling this robotic arm uh, just with, with thinking about moving her own arm. So what she says in the video is that, uh, that at first she had to kind of think about, you know, move left, rotate clockwise and all this and kind of give it a lot of thought but within a couple of hours she was able to operate this robotic arm and as if she was moving her own arm it's really quite amazing um so i'll just show you a, a little bit of the video again you don't you don't get quite as much with this one without the audio and without the full story so i really recommend you go watch it but you can see that's pretty good so that um, I think during, I think at this stage, this group had maybe seven degrees of freedom, but just a couple of years later, they um, they published a study that was ten degrees degrees of freedom, so different um, grasping, different uh, you know rotation, so so ten degrees of freedom of motion. Um, so something else that 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 same group has done is incorporated brain stimulation to restore sensation. And so I'll have a, a, a video in a second. This is one where you do kind of need the, <laughs> the audio, but we'll get away without it. Um, and the reason that they want to do this is beyond just restoring sensation and in, in itself is a, is a, you know, a good goal. It actually improves control of the robotic arm. So you can imagine that, you know, when you go to, if I go to reach out for my glass, um, you know, I'm using the information that I'm getting about, like, the pressure and the feel of the glass to, to actually pick up the glass. And if you didn't have that, then, you know, you'd be much less efficient in, in using your, your arm. So this group ha is trying to, um, has tried to restore sensation by actually stimulating the brain so that that would be the, the sensory cortex of the brain, which lies right next to the motor cortex, and using this to improve control of their robotic arm. So. Um, yeah, this one, this video is not going to be as great without the, without the audio, but basically what um, the researcher is doing. So this is uh, the, the research participant is blindfolded um, and the robotic arm. So the researcher is touching, you know, randomly touching the fingers of the robotic arm and the, the, uh, when they do that, the, you, the participant's brain is being stimulated at that, uh, the appropriate place in the motor cortex. And he is able to, he feels that, um, that pressure in his own hand and he gets, he, well, we can't hear it, but he gets a hundred percent accuracy of being able to detect which finger is being, um, touched. So that's pretty amazing. But the, this video demonstrates what a difference that having that sensation makes to being able to control the robotic arm. So, um, in the, on the left of the video. It's with that stimulation, so the the user is getting that feedback of the sensation of, you know, when when the robotic arm touches something, they are getting that sensation in their own arm, versus on the right where they don't have that feedback. So they're just trying to pick up the cylinder. So you can see on the left, it's just you know, 
very quick and it's much clumsier and slower on the right. Okay, so um, also, you know, in the last 15 years, there's been uh, BCI studies using different technologies. So different, sorry, different um, sensing technologies, report, uh, imaging technologies. So one is called functional near infrared spectroscopy. So this is a technology that is is has a worse temporal resolution than EEG. The response it measures is slower than the electrical signal, which is immediate. Um, it it actually is an optical imaging technology that me that measures that's a more indirect measure of neural activity. It measures the the changes in blood flow, which are um, come following the electrical. Um, the electrical response because of the increased metabolic demand of the tissue. It's the same response or very, very similar response to uh, what fMRI measures, um, if you're familiar with that. But the spatial resolution is, of this is much better. So uh, a lot of research groups are using or, or are investigating F and IRS alone, but also hybrid. So having systems that use EEG and NIRS together so that um, you know, the kind of uh, the good things about each of them, you can kind of get the benefits of both. Um, and this is this technology. I, I do EEG research now, but I did um, NIRS research in my in my graduate work, and that's actually me um, wearing an NIRS uh, headband. Um, so another thing that's been done in the last fifteen years is exploring different control strategies. So back on our little history timeline, we talked about the P three hundred sensory motor rhythms through motor imagery, um, the SSVEP. So while these are still used, as I mentioned a couple of times, the people have started to explore other things. So for EEG and, and NIRS, um, they've been looking at different mental tasks other than motor imagery. So things like more cognitive tasks, like mental arithmetic, word generation, mental singing. So things like this to see if we could get um, either more intuitive tasks or maybe get more commands. So the more different tasks that we can differentiate using you know, the machine learning, um, the more commands and the, the, you know, the faster the communication can be and the, the more functional the BCI will be. And speech decoding. So this is something that's going on in both the invasive and non-invasive um, kind of research. In terms of non-invasive, um, so speech, so it's basically just trying to, when someone imagines speaking, can we detect what, they're, what word they're imagining? So in terms of the non-invasive, um, there have been studies that have successfully differentiated, you know, four, five, six, kind of in that range words. Um, now they're predefined words. Obviously, they're not just, you know, again, th these systems can't read your mind and just read anything that you're thinking. It's predefined words. Um, but in the, there's actually a um, very recent study just in the last couple of months of a of a group. Um, from University of California, San Diego, using a invasive technology, and it's just the electrocorticography, so it's not the one that goes into the cortex, just, you know, is sub or epidural. And they were able to detect, so, so the, the, the BCI was trained to detect 50 words um, that could make up to like a thousand sentences or something like that. Um, so the person would just attempt to speak or imagine speaking, and the BCI uh, could could pick up the words that he was uh, or she was um, imagining or trying to communicate, and uh, with an accuracy, so 50 words with an accuracy up to, I believe it was up to 93% and 18 words a minute. On average, it was more around 78% accuracy and 15 words per minute. Um, but they, this was, they used not just the, the neural sensing, the BCI um, neural sensing technology, but they also incorporated like natural law, uh, language processing model. So the predictive text, basically, you know, there's certain patterns that language uh, generally takes on, like there's a verb will come after a, a pronoun, that, types of, that type of thing. So they, they combined those types of models that you'd have even on your phone with the BCI and, and were able to get pretty good accuracy. So this is a, Again, this one's not much to see in a short clip with no audio, but I do recommend you go and if this is on YouTube as well, I recommend that you go and look at it. So the users, so you can see again, it's a similar wired system here. Um, 
they're given a prompt prompt how are you today and using words out of that the 50 that the bci was programmed to detect he you know rather quickly is able to give a response so very very cool and that again a very recent study just 2021 okay so another thing we're doing for time here. I'm sorry if I'm going long here. Um, so uh, another interesting thing that's been done in BCI research in the last 15 years, and really maybe more like the last 10, is using BCIs in stroke neuro rehabilitation. So um, basically restoring hand movement after stroke. So just to go through how this works. So imagine this is a healthy brain, and this is the motor cortex. So in a in a healthy brain, the signals for, for intentional movement come from the motor cortex and it's actually the kind of crosses the body. So the signal for moving the left hand actually comes from the right side of the brain and vice versa. So in a healthy brain, if, I, if your brain sends a signal from the right motor cortex, that would move your left hand. If it sent a signal from your left motor cortex, that would move your right hand. And in general, that's how it works. But really, there's a little bit of a signal from the ipsilateral side as well, so the same side as the the hand that you're moving. So even though the si the signal mostly comes from the opposite side, a little bit, you know, comes from the the same side. So in a stroke injured brain, so say if there's injury at on this side on the left side of the motor cortex, that would mean that the person loses function in the right hand. So usually it would be one sided and the the person would lose function of of you know, be paralyzed on one side basically in their in their hand. So what BCI researchers have have tried to do is capitalize on this little bit of activity that happens on the same side. So usually the stroke injury is just on one side, so the other side would be intact. So what they've done is if they have the person whose brain has been injured by stroke, they get them to attempt movement of their hand or imagine movement, so motor imagery like we've discussed before. And while this side of the where's my cursor again? While this side of the brain is injured, so there's not enough signal coming, basically, I'm kind of, you know, maybe not be using the most scientific terms here, but there's not enough signal coming from, from that side to actually move the hand. Um, there's a little bit of signal coming from the other side. So, these, so we're going to exploit that. So we're going to detect that. So we know that the person is, is intending to move, trying to move, imagining moving. We're going to detect that little bit of signal use the BCI and feed that information back to the person. So in a way that, that kind of reinforces. So it could be an exoskeleton, maybe virtual reality of a, of a hand moving or functional electrical stimulation where electrodes are actually stimulate the muscle and get the hand to move. So that connection, um, so the, the person is then fed that back. So that connection between the imagining or attempting to move and actually seeing or feeling the hand move strengthens and kind of rewires that connection to the point that the person can then basically use this side of the brain to send that signal and restore function. So the neural pathway is rewired because we know the, the brain is very plastic, neuroplasticity um, is possible. And uh, so the, some clinical trials have shown this to be an effective way to actually restore movement to a um, person who, who has stroke and, and who was previously unable to use their hand. And finally, um, passive BCI. So all the BCIs that we've talked about so far, the person has been kind of intentionally controlling an external device, whether it's the robotic arm or the speller. But it's been activity that they've intentionally induced in their brain. <clears throat> so a passive BCI is a system. So what if from our example in the beginning where we, were, we want our robot to dance, what if instead of actually using activity that's con consciously controlled by us, sorry, there goes my Alexa, just Thank one second. Me now. This is actually my, <laughs> okay, I'm not even going to try. Okay, sorry, me now. Of course, that had to happen. You actually heard my my uh, 
children's bedtime warning that comes on every day at five to eight. Um, sorry about that. So imagine that instead of having brain activity that's consciously controlled by you, it's just uh, something else that's that's naturally occurring in your brain. It could be your um, you know, your, um, your affective state, whether you're happy, you're sad, you're stressed, you're frustrated, whether you're, you know, your level of mental um, workload, these types of things. And imagine, so imagine the, the robot dance, oh, sorry. Center view on again. Turned it off in the panic there. So imagine the robot um, comes on, starts to dance when you're happy, and then stops dancing when you're sad. So that would be a passive BCI. It wouldn't be a very useful application of a passive BCI, but this is just for illustrative purposes. But some, there are a lot of very, you know, potentially useful applications for a passive BCI. Or, so, for example, for um, in safety critical work environments where human error has, you know, catastrophic potentially consequences, um, detecting things like mental workload, fatigue, stress. Um, so there's a lot of work done in um, the aerospace industry and in pilots detecting workload, and then also in driving. So you know, truck drivers detecting fatigue. So um, if in the passive BCI could detect these different states, and in the case of maybe the driving, you know, send a signal if if, if a if a state of drowsiness or fatigue is detected, then a you know some some measure could be taken to alert the driver, wake the driver up. And similar in the in the case of, of pilots, um, if a state of, of very high mental workload is detected, then maybe you know that causes the system to uh, kick in the the autopilot or to take over some functionality. So it's this the passive BCI is meant to kind of enhance this computer human computer interaction. Other um, examples are optimized training programs. So just imagine if you had a you know a, an online training program or a training program maybe in a virtual environment or a simulator that could that could use brain signals to detect when a person is is you know has developed a certain skill and then you could you know move on once a skill has been adequately developed and if it hasn't you stay on that you know on that. Uh, research or sorry that learning objective or something like that or if you can detect that the person's workload is too high and so you know maybe this level is, is too advanced for them and kind of adjust um, accordingly so um, that could be a very useful application smart medical technology so this one's kind of a cool idea self-adjusting hearing aid so if the hearing aid could um, detect based on the brain signals say what the person uh, using the hearing aid is actually trying to listen to if it could if it could detect what um, the person is focusing on and just amplify that particular sound something like that um, so these are all things where it's just detecting brain activity that's naturally occurring and it's not being controlled by the user and it's not for the purpose of controlling a device necessarily neural marketing so imagine if your um, you know your <laughs> Ads could be even more suited to you than they are now if it could, you know, tell what products that you like, what um, what types of advertisement um, appeal to you, um, and then gaming and entertainment. So if you, you know, imagine having a video game that adjusted the level of difficulty depending on whether you're frustrated or bored or something like that, or maybe you have, you know, your uh, your playlist on your on your phone can detect what type of mood you're in and what song you want to listen to, something like that. So these are all very much in the research stage. There's no products that do any of these things that I just said. They're very much in the research phases, but um, kind of just ideas of potential applications. So I can't, um, this is the last thing I'll say, but I can't have a presentation about BCIs without mentioning Neuralink, because this is probably many, you know, many people, this is probably what you know, where they've heard of, of this technology. Oh my goodness, it's doing it again. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay, so um, Neuralink, if just this year, 
very recently. Um, you may have seen this video of, so they use their technology. I'm not gonna play the video, but um, they use this technology and a monkey was, was controlling um, with, their, with their interface, which is an invasive interface, was using the computer to play Pong. So if you remember from my timeline, this is kind of something that the Nicolaitis group did 20 years ago, right? So this isn't um, particularly, from a functionality point of view, this isn't particularly new. Um, what's kind of novel about Neuralink is the is the sensing technology itself. So Elon Musk has envisioned this technology that's wireless, can charge wirelessly, and right now those ele those um, intercortical electrodes that I showed you, they're very rigid. Um, it's not something, you know, there, there's, a, it's a very invasive technology, it requires an invasive surgery. It's the type of thing that, you know, unless the benefits outweighed the potential risks involved in that, people aren't going to use it. So for things like passive BCIs, which are mostly targeted at a healthy population, it's unlikely that anyone would, um, would opt to, to do an invasive technology for a, for a um, application like that. So Elon Musk has, has kind of this vision of having a, a technology that is, has a very, very, you know, minimally invasive procedure to, to implant it and that's comfortable and, you know, uh, all of these types of things. So I think that would be quite revolutionary if, if that technology was developed to that point. I, I don't believe that they're the only group looking at this. Um, I was just, I forget the name, Stren, Stentrode, I believe. I was just seeing it uh, earlier today that it looks like a kind of a similar goal. Um, but uh, right now, just in October, Elon Musk uh, had an update and they're hoping to do uh, human clinical trials in the next six months. But again, this is something that, you know, other groups have done, you know, many years ago. But if they um, are able to develop this technology to, to what, um, you know, they've, They've said their vision is it will be quite um, revolutionary. Um, but he has said, even as, as recently as October, that their main, uh, their first motivation will be for um, the rehabilitation um, applications, uh, people with, with disabilities. So similar to what we've, what we've spoken about. Um, Okay, so there's just some image attributions for the images that I've used and thank you very much. I'm sorry. I went a little longer than I intended, but thanks for for listening and sorry about the, the Christmas music and. Bedtime. <laughs> thank you very much. Dr. Power. That's a fascinating presentation and area of research for sure. I, I, I know I've learned a lot about BMIs and. And uh, it seemed mysterious to me before, but I think I really understand better how it works. So thank you again for the presentation. We do have some time for questions now. And in the uh, Q&A box, I notice um, there's a question here. I'll just read it. Uh, Dr. Peters, I guess you can see it as well, that we've seen in the movies where a BCI reads your thoughts, but it requires that you think in the right language. Is the real language detect? In the real language detection, does it matter what language you think in? Interesting question. Um, yes, it, it would. So, so in the, um, the, the last video I showed with the invasive technology and they were able to decode you know, the, the 50 words, what it's actually decoding is the motor um, activity. So it's related to the the motor um, signal that's sent to the vocal tract. So it's really about how your your mouth would be moving, and how your you know your vocal cords would move. So that would do, it's very word specific. So it's like if the BCI was trained to recognize the word help, it would be very specifically like how that is is conveyed in the motor cortex, which would be very different in English versus French because it would be different motion of the mouth. So yes, it's it's very specific to the the exact word that it's trained on. Okay, good good answer, good question, and good answer. Okay, um, I don't see any other questions, so that leaves me uh, opportunity for me to ask a question um, on the neural link. 
that you are showing there. That was quite interesting. I've heard though, also one of the goals is to potentially connect AI to the human brain. So what do you think about that? Is that realistic? What time frame could that happen? And how would that work going in the other direction? Like you were talking about, you know, humans sending a signal to a computer. Can it go in the other direction, like from AI to the human? Yeah, that's a big question. So it's it seems to me, so it depends it depends. It seems to me that that's a little ways in the future. You never know, especially with someone like Elon Musk, what, what he might come up with. But I, I feel like, so even, like I said, he said that their main goal now is, is in the more traditional um, applications of helping people with disabilities. I don't know how far in the future that will be. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of ethical implications of that. So I, I don't think that that's something, I'm hoping that's not something that's just, you know, rolled out without adequate you know policy put in place and, and things like that um in terms of it going the other way um yes that could be possible so i i showed the video of of how the you know restoring the sensation there are brain stimulation technologies so it, it is possible to go the other way and i was just seeing i was just looking actually i had not seen this before and i was just looking uh, earlier today and i saw a study from very recently within the last maybe year or two where it was brain to brain interface interface so it was a study where there was two people and they were sending signals back and forth to each other so it was actually using the ssvp technology that i talked about so one person would would make a choice and you know use the ssvp to send that signal and then the other person could not see what the person had sent or anything and their brain was stimulated at the frequency of the signal the person was trying to send and whether they perceived that flash of light or not they could tell what the person was choosing so it's very early stage and it's not nearly to the point where we would think of when we when we hear these media announcements of you know Elon Musk wants to cyborg you know make us all cyborgs it's not nearly to that point yet and i honestly don't know when it will be there and i i, I frankly personally hope it's not soon but it there is that that potential and, and work is being done in that in that area. It's very it's a big Perfect. question. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Are there any resources that you can recommend to learn more about BCIs? Yeah, absolutely. So the, I I if people are interested in academic papers, I, I cited a number in the different slides and I'm happy to share if anyone, you know, feel free to email me and I can send those. And also the video, I really do, like I said, highly recommend going and looking at the, the videos. I've just shown you short clips, but you really don't get the full, it, a lot of the time too, it really is the story of the patient and you realize what the impact of these technologies could possibly be. So I've shown you kind of, they're cool from a technological point of view, but when you when you see the stories of these people and what a you know difference it can make and how emotional they get about it, it really does kind of drive home the the potential impact of these technologies. So I recommend just good old fashioned YouTube search as well. And feel free to reach out and if you'd like more information, I can direct you. Another good question, maybe we'll have time for just one more. Um, is it possible to control a prosthetic hand using the non-invasive BMI approach? So it could be, but keep in mind, it's all about the number of commands um, that the, the resolution of the, of the motor signal that you can get. So the reason that you're able to, in the invasive technology to get such a you know, good control is because those electrodes are being placed over the motor cortex and are detecting at the individual neuron level. So remember, I showed you that picture of the motor cortex and what all the different body parts. So if you, take that electrode and you put it right there, you you can get the signal from this finger and this finger and this finger and this finger, and that's why you're able to do that. But with the non-invasive technology, your spatial resolution is much, much worse. And you're lucky if you can get hand versus foot versus tongue. So for a prosthetic hand, you could have something that, you know, if you only need a couple of commands, you might be able to do like open, close, twist, that type of thing, but it wouldn't be to the same level of control. 
Yeah, that that makes makes sense. Thank you, Dr. Power. You explained it well there. Um, okay, I think that concludes the questions. And I noticed there's uh, quite a few comments also in the in the in the chat box there, Sarah, about how super interesting your your talk was and how how people enjoyed it. Good to see. I'm glad to see that. Good feedback. So. Sarah, I'd, I'd like to thank you once again for sharing your expertise on this fascinating topic. And, and at this time, I'd like to invite Mark Fewer to say a few words on behalf of Peganel. Thank you, Dr. Natterer, and uh, thank you, Dr. Power. That was a fantastic presentation, uh, really, really interesting stuff. Um, at Peganel, we're aware, of course, of the impact that engineering and geoscience has in our daily lives, uh, especially in ways that many wouldn't normally associate with the professions. Um, you know, the possibilities we, we've heard about tonight demonstrate not only the, the breadth of engineering, but also how the people behind that work are, are truly engaged in creating a better society. Um, one of the things we talk a lot about in our organization is that engineering is a caring profession. Uh, and the solutions developed through engineering helps the human race in, in far reaching and inclusive ways. And, you know, your presentation tonight is, is a great example of that. There's, there's no doubt that along with the, the know how and the intellect, it's the drive to improve the quality of life uh, for others that really help make advancements like these possible. Uh, Peganel is delighted to be a sponsor of the Speaking of Engineering series. And we really value the close connection that we have with the Peckley of Engineering. Uh, thank you once again, Dr. Power. I'm sure those watching will agree that tonight's event was both uh, insightful and inspirational. So thank you once again. Mark, thank you very much for those uh, for those words. And I'd like to again just thank Sarah for her uh, for her presentation this evening, and a few other people I'd like to mention: Paul Martin from CITL, who helped keep the technical side of things in order this evening. And also Jackie Locke, the, the communications officer here in our faculty that uh, did a wonderful job in, um, in circulating this and attracting you all to, to join tonight for this presentation. So that concludes our lecture this evening. I hope you've all enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, good idea, Jackie. Why don't we give a round of applause to our guest speaker? A virtual round of applause. Thank, I'd like to thank all the attendees as well for joining this evening. That concludes our lecture. I hope you all have a good evening and um, that's all for now. Good night and until next time, bye.